Jewish chaplains have been consistent in the Army, both in the reserve world and, of course, on active duty. Uh, I really didn't know any of them, none of them. I, I had no idea where they are. And, and I really wasn't sure what my role was to be in the Army, except that you get a uniform and uh, you go to a unit. So with time, I, I, trained, I went to school, military school, chaplain school, and I learned uh, what it takes and what it means to be an Army chaplain. An Army chaplain means, in, in, the very sh in a very short statement, an Army chaplain is you are the spiritual um, role model for soldiers, you are the moral and morale voice for the command and for the commander. And uh, since chaplains start off at the lowest level of command, that would be at the battalion level, you would be a battalion chaplain. And that's where I started off my career. And slowly but surely, I got to learn the Army um, language and got the chance to learn what it takes, what it means to be a chaplain. And a very important uh, note, whether you're Jewish or you're not Jewish, you're a chaplain for all your, all your soldiers. Uh, I happen to be Jewish, so I also include uh, Jewish soldiers in my um, vocation. But um, most of the soldiers that I've ever served, and, and in fact anybody, if you're Jewish, whether you're active duty or not, the bulk of the soldiers that you'll serve are not Jewish. So therefore, a, a chaplain has to be prepared to understand that, that he doesn't um, get engaged in somebody else's religion. That's not your job. Your job is to help the soldier uh, get somebody or find his way to his religion and you direct him or you bring him to a chaplain or bring a chaplain to him uh, if that's what it takes. On active duty today um, before this big push um, there were 23 um, Jewish chaplains for the whole world for combat not combat on active duty full time and uh, the last uh, since December uh, and by the end of June on the, at least in the Army, we'll have brought on uh, five more uh, chaplains, of course at the, at the bottom ranks, but that's not important. The point is that they're coming. And, um, and I think it'll be the largest amount of chaplains as a group, Jewish chaplains, in the Army, and that's where I am. I'm in the Army that the um, military has seen at least in the last 15 years. When you're in the war zone, the day in the life of a soldier is very simple. Um, since I don't carry a weapon, um, I could be both on the base camp, or I could, as I would do, I go out with my soldiers, and 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 I'm with them whatever they're doing. Um, in the in, I guess Gulf War One, if you want to call that, in Israel, um, I was I was the uh, American troops that were there were were air defense artillery, that's what Patriots are called. And so I learned, I had, never, I had never been around those type of soldiers. I learned very quick. You learn, very, you learn what you gotta learn very, very quick. And it was a very pressure job on the soldiers that were there because as one said, said it's a zero defects environment. We cannot afford to miss or hit a Scud missile or at least knock it off course because the population in front of us is dense. In other words, uh, if you understand how the Patriot works, um, it, it works, it's placed kind of the rear of a heavily defended, of a, of a heavy populated area. In fact, it's really used as an air defense weapon, but here they use it to protect citizens of, of Israel. Um, so I got to learn that. Or when I went to, um, to Afghanistan, uh, that was different. Uh, the soldiers were on the ground, all infantry, armor, um, went, to visit, went out to the villages, uh, I wasn't there that long. I made the, the rounds in the Middle East. I was in different countries at that time, trying because we didn't have any Jewish chaplains deployed forward, and I was I was I was the only person at that time, at least during Pesach, Passover that year. Um, I was in Iraq. I was with everybody. I was all over the place. So you were you're with soldiers. You are, and you you get to stay with them, sleep with them, you eat with them get shot at with them. It's all, all the above. I, I would say that for me, over these many years in the Army, I've learned, first of all, about people. Uh, no two people are the same. Um, and as a chaplain, you get a chance, 
whether you understand it or not, to influence people. You know, you're a Jewish chaplain, your, your sphere of influence is larger than just the Jewish community of a base or wherever you are. So because you do that, you really have to be sharp about your wits. You have to know what you're doing. And uh, so you can influence people in a positive way and, and that they want to come back and to talk to you, to be part of your congregation, your kahila, wherever you are, no matter what it is. You know, you'll get them the first time, but they may not show up the second time. So the key is to, to want to make it that they like it. And, and that's the important thing. So, um, and that's what I've tried to do wherever I've been in the Army. Of course, in, in peacetime, it's different. Uh, it's a different type of uh, Army. Uh, and soldiers train constantly, for one thing, for the, you know, the eventuality of should there be a war. But, and if you go, you've got to be trained and equipped, and um, the chaplain's there to help in the, in the moral and the spiritual uh, aspects of a soldier. Because um, every leader in the army will say a, a, a fit soldier is a spiritual soldier, and that's a it's a big that's a big thing. That he's grounded in something, and that's the important thing. I've been deployed in combat um, around ten times in my career, give or take one or two times. I'm not sure if I sat or counted them out of my fingers where I've gone, what years I would know, but about ten times. And in combat, a, a decision a commander has to make when he commits his soldiers or commits force to be used is, um, you know, collateral damage. That's a nice way of saying it, but uh, civilian casualties. And, and how do we deal with that? And um, what, are the, what are the moral implications? Not only in general, but specifically for his men, uh, the people under his command. And, and there's a, a great, there, there are great um, books written about the just war, the moral war, etc. And uh, as a chaplain, you try to help that commander uh, walk, walk through his decision-making process. Uh, that he knows that if he, if he asks you, I mean, you're not obligated, but if he, if he calls you in and says, chaplain, you heard the game plan, what do you say? Then you're, you will then get involved. I remember during the Gulf War, I was in Israel. I was, I was deployed to Israel. I was supposed to go to the Middle East. I was actually supposed to go to Saudi Arabia and then on with the rest of my soldiers. And I got uh, deployed away from my soldiers and attached to the Patriots, the missiles. And I was the task force chaplain as a major. I remember the, the first day, I got, I got there in the evening and they were prepping you know, for attacks because Saddam Hussein had this thing about attacking Israel at night. Don't know why, but maybe thought people would be more frightened. I guess nighttime is more frightening. And uh, as I walked into this meeting, um, uh, one of the Israelis that were, they were all sitting at the table, Americans and Israelis, uh, he stopped me uh, professionally and he said that, well, you know, we're having a meeting and this is not where rabbis go. I said, um, in the United States Army, uh, chaplains are part of the command team, and whatever the command does, the chaplain's usually sitting at the table. And it caught the Israelis by surprise. They had never heard that before. I mean, in Israel, the, their chaplain's role is much different than we do here in the United States. Um, so um, I guess he, what he said was, if that's the way it is, that's the way it is. But they were taken aback, and they were even more further taken aback, uh, the fact that our, the commander, since it was our meeting, the Israelis, even though it was in Israel, um, asked that the meeting start with a prayer and I should do the prayer. They were totally um, floored, lack of a better word. And, and they said, you know, with a smile afterwards, they're all nice people. Uh, they don't do that in the IDF. I said, well, maybe we'll start, we'll start something new. And, and, um, and it, what, what uh, uh, surprised them, took them back, is that Nobody in that room other than myself and the Israelis were Jewish, yet the commander asked that we start with a prayer. And, and I explained to them that our, our military is by and large a religious organization. Whatever religion you are, you are, but uh, it is a religious organization. So that's kind of an anecdotal, interesting story uh, my role as a chaplain and explained to the Israelis of all people. 
The Rebbe spoke many times of Fabrengans that the most important thing that we can learn from, from a soldier is Kabbalah so, You know, the person has responsibility and that he knows what he has to do and what he has to do. Uh, the Rebbe would say, you know, a soldier stands at attention for hours. He doesn't ask why, because that's what his job is. And, and he makes sure that his buttons are polished on his uniform when he does that, because that's how he has to be. So the Rebbe would always say, you know, we have to polish our buttons and stand at attention, knowing that we have to receive the heavenly yoke. And, and he said that they, there's no greater lesson to be learned than that of a soldier.